So what do you need to actually start learning uh, FastCI? Not really much. Just the internet connection, some a desire to actually learn how to do it, and maybe some high school math if you want to go deeper into it. So these two lessons uh, each week are more or less divided into two sections. Uh, this week is uh, very much introductory and slowly goes into doing all the different tasks. And Fridays will be a lot more advanced tasks for learning how to do state-of-the-art things and actually getting the maximum performance out of whatever model you're using at the time. Today we'll basically just be going over how to make a vision task uh, determining the species uh, from a picture of that animal. Google Colab is a platform um, for doing Python. It's uh, one of the more useful platforms that they that's offered. It has some free resources like a, I believe like 15, 16 gigabytes of GPU as well. So. It's pretty powerful for being a free tool offered to everyone, I could say that much. Alright. So if you select a runtime at the top there, and change runtime, set it to, make sure it's on Python 3 and hardware accelerator to GPU. Uh, these two sections are basically just pulling from a GitHub account. So here's, uh, these are some basic functions that you use for most cases. And uh, along with them, if you go into the notebook later, you can check out the docs and the source code for them. These uh, docs and the source code is definitely uh, one of the primary sources you should look into for doing different things. So in your first plot, you should have uh, FastAI already imported or uh, downloaded from GitHub, but you need to import FastAI modules themselves. So FastAI supports four different data data types: computer vision, obviously just some images, natural language processing, and tabular data. That can literally be anything from predicting salary to uh, someone's height. Collaborative filtering is it's basically an advertisement uh, sort of thing for predicting someone's likes and dislikes. So now what we want to do is uh, check out Untar data. If you put uh, the function followed by two question marks or help, and in the parentheses the function, you can pull up the definition of that function. They uh, they also offer data sets in, like, included in the FastAI library whenever you import it. So if you do path equals untar data urls pets, we want to get this Oxford pet library. The pet library contains a data set for 37 different species of uh, pets. All right, now that we have the pets data set, you can uh, actually look into the path basically like you would with a Linux uh, system to see that we have the annotations and images folder. What we, all we want to do is just pull out the uh, path for the images right now. Now we will be pulling the file names. So these file names we use to pull the classes out of the file name itself. So a lot of these data, data sets have it categorized into multiple folders. In um, a train set, it might have, in this case, it would be 37 different folders for each species. Uh, but some data sets will have a set of work like this, where it'll have all the pictures in one folder, and you'd have to take the labels out of the file name itself. Or you'll have a CSV for each of the classifications. Can you go up one more? Sure. Is that it? Yeah.
And what we're doing right here, uh, we, we just want to pull like, just a small section off just to look at what it's like. So colon five basically says grab the first five uh, items. So now, uh, right here with NP random seed, uh, so it's standard to set up the seed before you do everything so that everything is a bit more non-biased so that everything is more unified and you get very similar results. And pattern equals uh, the regular expression. Right there we are pulling out the labels for each of the classes, like each of the images themselves. Or we're setting up the regular expression compiler for that. A bit to type in. All right. Now that we have all the preliminary information, we can start uh, creating the data bunch. And we're using the regular expression to pull that file name as the label. So right here, we'll be pulling the path for the images. So this is telling the image data bunch where to start pulling the uh, images from. The file names that we'll be using the pattern for the regular expression, and then the uh, the data set transforms basically just tells it to slightly modify it, flip it, do different like transforms with it so it can make sure it knows different sort of uh, patterns and whatnot. And then we normalize it using the ImageNet stats. Yeah, so ImageNet as a bit of a preliminary information is a massive data set of a lot of different pictures. And what ImageNet stats is, is the RGB channels and taking the mean and standard deviation of them and just normalizing the uh, data sets, uh, data bunches, images. And now to show the batch. So these, uh, the data bunch is organized into a few bits of information. So whenever you're working with artificial intelligence, you're going to be organizing them into train sets, uh, validation sets, and test sets. The validation set is used to actually measure the different learning rates, different uh, numbers of epochs, and stuff like that. So the test set will be the final result overall. The FastAI modules, they basically treat the test set as a Kaggle competition. So it doesn't include the labels for actually predicting. You just have to like get the results and submit it to the Kaggle competition. And Kaggle is a big website for artificial intelligence competitions. And we can actually go in a little bit kind of like under the hood a bit, uh, seeing all of the different class names and getting the number of classes. All right, now that we have all the, all of the data set uh, input and everything, we can actually start making the learner for the uh, neural network. All right, so here we're making a convolutional neural network. Uh, we'll be importing data, so the image uh, data set, the data bunch that we made earlier. Models.ResNet34. So ResNet34 is a residual network. It's a model that is pre-trained on uh, ImageNet, I believe. So it it's very well trained to recognize of varying like thousands of different things. It's recognized animals, cars, text, all that kind of stuff. So we kind of want to transfer learning from a model that someone else has already done. So we do our own stuff off of it. And metrics. So whenever you do neural network training, it will tell you different metrics for uh, how well the validation set is going. So error rate is 
pretty common and easy one to work with. Just saying the percentage of it, that's obviously wrong. So now we'll be fitting. So what Fit One Cycle does is basically taking this number of epochs and training it each time for that. So an epoch is basically saying how many times it should go through the data set and start doing that regression on each bunch of images. So whenever you're done with a uh, training set, like just training one stage of it, you want to go ahead and uh, save it. So whenever you're uh, doing more fitting, you don't want to mess it up. You want to have like a just a little save point to go back to. Uh, whenever it's done training, uh, we want to look at how how well that model did. And to do so, we use a classification interpretation. Basically, that's just uh, a way of plotting different uh, losses and whatnot. And so this last line, that's not exactly something you are going to do normally. That's just basically saying that the, um, the amount of information in there is equal to the validation set, which means that the classification interpretation is pulling from the validation set, not the training or test set. All right, so right here, what this means is when it says plot top losses, uh, a loss is basically how wrong it is. If uh, So whenever we say plot top losses, we want to find the images that would be most wrong. So uh, whenever you make a prediction, it's saying the, pretty much the likelihood of something being whatever you're classifying towards. And here we are actually finding the images that were the most away from what it thought it actually was. And here is basically just a kind of a different way of saying what classes it got wrong. So all that's supposed to be different, like whoever inputs it, it's going to be different from what you guys have? It will be mostly the same, so it kind of depends on a bit of chance, yeah. but for the most part, it will be pretty similar. And right here, we'll actually start kind of seeing that sort of similarity in a sense. So whenever we do most confused, I'd almost guarantee Berman, Ragdoll, and uh, Pitbull Terrier will be somewhere in the top, like, seven. Because those are really hard to differentiate from. Yep. It'll be mostly the same. So now we'll be going, um, we're going, we're going a bit under the hood here. So this will be how you actually load the model again. That. All right, once you have it loaded again, we can start doing unfreeze. So the reason why uh, the layers aren't frozen already, or aren't unfrozen already, is because we're only training on a few layers at the end. We're still basing it off of uh, the aforementioned uh, pre-trained set. All those layers before it are still saying for animals and like text and signs and walls and stuff like that. Now we're actually going in and changing the base model for how it's classifying everything. Which is why once you start, uh, once you unfreeze it and start training again, that error rate is going to shoot up a lot for at least a few epochs. So to kind of go a little bit deeper into knowing what it's actually doing, we need to know what a learning rate is. If we treat machine learning as like a bit of a, a bit of a curve, 
we need to find this spot right here, oh, right there. And so what a learning rate is, is how, how far it should go down each of these steps. If your learning rate is too high, then it'll end up shooting up past it and end up going back out. We don't, we don't want to, we don't want to do that. We want to have it smaller so that it goes down and meets the very bottom of this valley, but doesn't go past it and doesn't, it isn't so small that it will take forever. And to do so, we need to figure out exactly what learning rate we should be using. So to do that, we use LRFind, which is basically a way of testing a bunch of different learning rates and finding loss. We, we want to find a very long descent of loss. So for this one specifically, it's good to slice it around here. So a uh, way to interpret this is 1e neg 5 and then 2e neg 5, each of these tiny little dashes underneath it as a number up each time. For this one specifically, we want to kind of slice it 3e neg 6 to about 2e neg 5 to 3e neg 5. We, we want to have the highest learning rate and have the bottom slice to be 10 times under that highest, as a minimum at least. So I need to three. You said three. Three eight oh five. Three neg five or three neg six to three neg five. Yeah. So this dash right here would be one neg five. So this is actually this is scientific notation. Okay. And so one neg five, two neg five, and just each number up. No, so you might get a little bit of a better learning rate. So for this one, we only got basically the same results out of actually um, getting the learning rate specifically out of the LR find. Though you might get 1% better, just kind of depends on a bit of chance. So now what we want to do is the same data bunch creation, but with a ResNet 50 model. Uh, the only difference is that it has some more layers to make some more differentiation between uh, features on it in each of the images. So we'll do a fit one cycle for two epochs. You'll, you'll get pretty decent results uh, right off the bat, and just straight up, probably even better than what you had before. Now you want to save it and do the same LR find again. Now this time around, it, the LR find will be significantly different from before. In this case, instead of using a slice, I found that just setting the max learn rate to be right about here, 40 neg 4 to be the best, because that is actually before it starts getting worse and going upwards in loss. You still want to find that longest curve uh, or longest uh, slope downwards as you can. Although sometimes it may not be apparent, sometimes that you just need to cap it somewhere to find the best limit rate. And from here, uh, going to different places to learn, uh, FastCI Forums is a very solid place to go. They've been discussing a lot lately for the new version of FastCI that they're releasing. It's very heavily in development right now. Uh, Zachary Muller, the person doing uh, Friday's lessons, uh, his handle is uh, MullerZR. You will find him a lot on the FastCI forums. Uh, basically, anytime I Google anything, I end up finding him on the forums. So, a few things to take away: how to make data bunches, how to make groups of data from a data set, 
creating the learner and fine-tuning specific parameters like the learning rate and the number of epochs. Uh, if you go to the GitHub page, you can go and uh, check out the documentation and forums that are linked in here as well. And uh, Zach and I's emails are in here as well. <laughs>